She was very well prepared. She was pleasant. She was fair. And she was gentle, but she was always in control. If she had any favorites, and we're all human, I'm sure that all teachers have favorites, but if she had any, she didn't show it. Everyone was treated equally and with dignity. I don't remember her ever giving anyone the strap. In fact, I don't even recall her ever being upset and angry. Some and all of these recollections are why she is so fondly remembered by her ex-pupils, and how many are here tonight are, uh, were taught by Miss Young? Would you please raise your hand? Well, there's a lot of absent ones. They won't. Huh? <laughs> uh, let's hear it for Miss Eileen Young, and we'll get on with her. Uh, excuse me, can, can you hear, uh, because we could, uh, oh, we'll, keep forgetting we that. try to put that in a little yes. closer, uh, Ms. Young, please, okay. and uh, if you'll speak right into it as we go. We, uh, yeah. uh, because people don't want to miss what you have to say. Oh, I, yeah. uh, I wanted to briefly uh, discuss uh, your schooling. You went to school in Young's Point? Yes, and then I went to... Uh, St. Joe's Academy and then the boarding school. And then I went three years there and then I went to St. Peter's High School. That's it. Oh, I went to normal school to be a teacher. And then I went three or four years to Queens in the summertime for summer courses and that's it. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I wanted to know, and it's always puzzled me, and perhaps uh, uh, Mr. Leahy or Mr. Grills can help us, why did they call it normal school? I don't know, I'd love to know. I, I, it's such a strange nomenclature. Did anyone offer anything on that? Yes, I read it the other day in the newspaper. And oh. it says because they taught the normal and accepted practices of the day. Yeah. There we hear that. They taught the normal and accepted practices of the day. Thank goodness they don't have a normal yeah. school today. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> the teachers that have bones through their noses. <laughs> uh, so uh, you were you came to Lakefield to teach, and uh, in about 1939, I believe, or 38. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you remember having an interview? Oh yes, you know uh, Grace Young was always the secretary all, all the time, and uh, oh, yeah, and Buzz Snarley was on the board. And, uh, and certainly Mr. Jim Rittath would be on the board, was he not? Um, yes, I think so. Uh -huh. I can't. Uh, uh, and you taught in Lakefield, I think, for a period of uh, six, six years. years. Uh huh. And uh, I boarded down at Dora Max. They called her Dora Mac. You know, Macmillan Dora. 
Oh, the John McKellen yeah, track dancer. Yeah. And then uh, when I was there, that Mr. Monroe was there that's in the high school. And uh, Bessie Dunn and Bess Daver, you all remember her, <coughs> Bessie Dunn. And then uh, <clears throat> I moved up to the hotel and I lived in the hotel for the rest of the time, the Lakefield Hotel, which is gone now. And Don took me tonight around the, to see my old school, and it's gone too. <laughs> and the school I taught in in Peterborough is gone, and the school I taught in in Codrington is gone. So I don't know what kind of influence I ever had. <laughs> they're all gone but me. And Keevan, the lady that's here tonight, remembers how. Keevan, do you want to tell them? About dancing? No, but how you always tell me that you used to, when you went to high school, you used to listen outside the door and hear me playing the white cockade. Oh, I didn't listen outside the door. I listened very fast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't that kind of person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Eileen was teaching in the elementary school, and I was in high school, and I don't remember what grade now, but she played every morning uh, the set time about playing this white cockade, and I'm, I assume it was for young kids to dance to. I don't think they were singing. Oh, no, we weren't dancing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> to march to, sometimes oh, they maybe, march to. Maybe. Anyway, there was a purpose, and it was pretty regular. And it didn't last, you know, the whole year. It was just for a time. But, but I was fortunate enough to know what the tune was. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Stephen, because I forget now how it goes. <laughs> uh, when you first came uh, to teach in Lakeville, who was the principal? Mr. Sloan. Mr. Sloan and his son sitting over with us. I know, Tim. I know Timmy. Uh -huh. And who were some other fellow staff members? Well, Bessie Dunn. No, not Bessie. She was in high school. Marie DeJury and uh, Marion Comrie, as I said, and, er and Everett Sloan was the principal, and, Ber and Bertina. Beavis and uh, Elsie Kidd, they were all up. Yeah. And Lucille Moore? Oh, and Lucille Moore, yes, I uh -huh. had her down there. Yeah, she was my grade four teacher. Yes. And uh, uh, you, did you always teach grade three? You taught me in grade three. Yes, it was mainly, I didn't like anything about grade three. When they gave me grade four in Peterborough, I quit because they start getting bold and rusty. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I think you've mentioned nearly them all, except that uh, uh, did uh, Jean Rinpat teach with you then? Do you remember? Uh, Not Jean Rinpat. No, no, Jean was my great friend, though, the librarian. Yeah, she was a librarian. She yeah. also taught at uh, various times at the school. How about uh, John Ray? He taught. Uh, oh, he was boarding at that house where I was. At he was, house. John Ray. Yeah. And how about Mr. Parkin, who later became a doctor in uh, Marmara? Did he I teach know there? Him, but he wasn't there then. He was. No. I see. And uh, uh, who was the caretaker in those days? Charlie Bickle. That's right. And uh, those of you who will recall Charlie Bickle, he was the caretaker, but he looked like an executive right off Bay Street. He always had a three-piece suit on with a watch, gold watch fob, and he was a wonderful man. And, and actually, what had happened is that he had uh, uh, worked a, a lifetime in, in Toronto, and like everybody else that have a, has any intelligence, wanted to come back to this area to retire, and he came back here in semi-retirement and was caretaker of the public school. And he, he was, I have a picture, and I loaned it right now, uh, of he and Mr. Tom Chapman, the previous principal of Mr. Sloan together, and you just, you'd think that uh, uh, Charlie Bickle was the principal and Tom was the caretaker. <laughs> uh, he was really well dressed. Uh, how about the facilities? Uh, did anything remarkable about the school that you remembered? Uh, well, I remember the children best of all, but I remember those stairs, they were so steep, you had to go up those stairs. You know, two layers of stairs to get up, and, and I didn't mind going up them. But oh, I forget the thing. <laughs> and uh, but uh, I used to feel sorry for a lot of people, like for Alice Foster. She was crippled, and she had to go up those stairs. But anyway, I can tell you from experience that you better not let Mr. Sloan catch you sliding down. <laughs> oh no, I don't. Uh, do you remember the bell? What oh, kind yes. of school I bell? I was wondering, where did that bell come from that was here? 
I don't know, but I sure remember the one in uh, our public school. Yeah. Can you tell us about it? Well, I just remember that the, the, the Mr. Sloan drove and ring the bell. It was a huge, big bell, big I remember. Big, yeah. And it used to sit uh, right outside his uh, room, uh, uh, and they used to ring it out the window uh, right outside uh, the door to his room. Yeah. And Ralph Millage, you all know Ralph Millage, or a lot of you would. He used to tell, he'd be our plumber after that. And he'd always be telling me about, you know, I often used to ask to leave the room so I could stand outside your door and listen to you play the piano. <laughs> and I said, is that all you remember about? But the, I used to play it a lot for him because I thought it was good to start the day with a cheerful piece and we played Colonel Bowling March and, and Bright Happy Things, you know, to get them started. <laughs> so apparently a lot of people were listening and I didn't know it. <laughs> and do you remember the time, whoever was here, do you remember the time Jeffrey Hutter, we sent Jeff, poor Jeffrey out to get a Christmas tree? And Jeffrey, do you remember Jeffrey was a big, big stout boy? And he went lumbering out to get the tree and he came back and he was so proud of it for it was a cedar tree, a straggly, a straggly cedar tree. And the kids were all so upset. That isn't a Christmas tree. We wanted a spruce tree. Well, I didn't. I said, that's a lovely tree. We'll just make the best of it. And uh, I told him it was the nicest tree we ever had. I, I remember that specifically, and you did. And, uh, and everybody accepted it and had as good a Christmas as they could have. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, how many pupils would you have in your room in that era? A one year, I had 46. 46. 46. We should go on strike. <laughs> usually, usually 38 or from 35 to 38 or so, but 46. But you know, people say, well, how did you do that? But children respected you then, and you taught with love, and there's all that's gone now. They ruined education, I think. And my, I have three daughters teachers, and they can't dare put a hand on the child to comfort them or to encourage them, you know? And I think that's so important with children. But anyway, um, well, well, yeah, we planted flowers, too, around the uh, outside of the, that was agriculture, I guess that was. Was that Arbor Day? Did you do that? Or that was just oh, a well, clean-up day, wasn't it? Yeah, but Arbor Day, we went out and cleaned the yard, eh? Do you remember that? Pick up the junk. <laughs> and, but now, I, uh, do I have your permission to tell about you, Jimmy? <laughs> I won't tell if you don't want to. <laughs> well, <laughs> Jimmy's turned out to be a fine young man, but... <laughs> anyway, he was down in grade one and grade two, and he was a little mischief, always throwing something or doing something. Teachers wouldn't say anything to him because his father was the principal. <laughs> so uh, he got up to my room and he was doing a few of those little mischievous things. And nowadays, you'd think nothing of it. But one day, I thought, I can't take it on. And on the way to school, I go to, to uh, home to Dora Max for dinner. And I pray all of them, please God make Jimmy Sloan behave. <laughs> <laughs> all morning, I'd say that. And then in the afternoon, please God make Jimmy Sloan behave. <laughs> and so one day, he up and threw a rubber right across the room. And that did it. I just couldn't take it any longer, and I gave him a strap. And uh, you wouldn't dare do that now, but nowadays they might be throwing an arrow or a gun across it, a bullet across it. And anyway, uh, his father came in very gently and said, Miss Young, don't you think there are other ways to punish a child? I said, yes, Mr. Sloan, but all the other ways have been tried. <laughs>
And last year they brought me down to me and Melba brought me some beautiful green beans and green juice and everything. So all is forgiven. <laughs> so what, uh, what was your favorite subject to teach? Oh, English and grammar and art. I love the music. Those were my special. English, grammar, art, and music. And do you remember we used to, when they do a good job uh, through the day, I'd say, well, now we're going to have a trip on silver wings. We, I'd pretend this airplane would be silver wings, and we'd take a trip to the far off places that we're studying about to see if we were going to Japan or if we we're studying about India. We'd say, now everybody hop on the plane. They had such imagination then, and you could play on it. And uh, I'd go up to the board and draw an airplane, and, and then we'd go on the trip. And once I remember saying, come on now, uh, we're not all on here. Johnny isn't here yet. I looked down, and one of the kids was fooling around and said, Oh, I said, we'd have to go without Johnny. He's not ready. And up with Johnny jumped. <laughs> <laughs> Come running up to the front. I'm going, Miss Young, I'm going. <laughs> and so then I drew the airplane on the board, and one kid says one day, Well, he says, We won't go far in that plane, Miss Young, because it has no propeller. <laughs> so, and then. Uh, Anyway, you anyway, might let's see where I am here now. Oh yeah, there was one other, uh, I taught 500 or 600, between 500 and 600 kids through my six year, 10 years of teaching. But the only two that I ever had to give a strap to was Jimmy Sloan and Gordy Blake. And I don't, I don't they both turned out well. See, they didn't hurt any one of them because yeah. Gordy owns half a lake to this. <laughs> going to ask you about any trips, any school trips, but you told us about Silver Wings, so. Oh, that's how we went on a trip, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and Gordy Blake, yeah, it didn't hurt either one. Jim went on the university and has a lovely home and a lovely wife. And where's Melba tonight? She didn't come. I didn't teach Melba, did I? No, I don't. Now who remembers the, the Mozart's Minuet that we did? Nobody here that was in it. Um, my, my brother was in that group. Who was that? George Kelly. George Kelly, yeah. Oh, you're Joan or Helen? I'm Helen. Helen, yes. Nice to see you. Well, Mozart's Minuet. Mozart's Minuet. And we had to, uh, B. Gilman made the outfits. Anybody remember B. Gilman? Yeah. She made the outfits, you know, the old lovely outfits for the children. And um, I played the Mozart's Minuet and we trained them. It didn't go over very well. We were asked to go down and perform for the St. Joseph's graduation. And uh, it was very nice. And the children, well, Barb Hammond was in it and a lot of kids, well, all the kids were Who was the inspector when you were teaching in Lakeville? An inspector of schools. Well, when I was up at the head of the lake, it was Mr. Powell. No, I can't remember. Was, was Mr. Birkin? Did you ever have That's it. K.O. Birkin? Yeah. And were you nervous in the days that he would come? No, not particularly. I was too busy to be nervous. <laughs> Was he uh, pleasant and kind and helpful with you? Oh, yes. Because many teachers, that was tragedy day when the inspector came. Oh, I know it was an awful thing oh, worried about. It. We'd get lectured three days before he got there, two days after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. uh, they don't, uh, I don't think they have such a governmental uh, uh, body and official that comes into classrooms now, do they? I don't know. It's I just don't their know. own local superintendent who taught with you the year before, I think. <laughs> Anyway, the government comes in. They pass all these bureaucratic. There's too much bureaucracy. They pass all these 
laws for the teachers, regulations galore, and they keep coming down from above, raining down, and they hardly get time to get them sorted out, nobody to help them figure out how to do it. So there's another raft of it, regulations in town. And they're teaching, oh, well, I mustn't get going on that, but <laughs> <laughs> they're teaching in grade 11, they're teaching university math, and that's too hard for children. I mean, there's something they can't cope with it. It's a lot of stress for some kids. They say, well, some pass, and so that proves it was good. But it was because they work like dogs. I have a, um, I have four granddaughters in the university now, different ones all over the place. But uh, uh, the youngest granddaughter that I have, Timmy, she's just 17, and she is a brilliant student. I mean, she got 92 in all her tests and everything. But she couldn't cope with that math this year. She was having a terrible time, and she wants to be a lawyer. Well, they wanted her to take uh, calculus, which was the route. That's a hard, hard one. And they were all they were all trying to do stuff that was university work. So the poor kids got so stressed out. And that's the only reason they did well. They worked like dogs to get, you know. So I felt sorry for the kids, really. But anyway, she went in to head a session with the, somebody that was. I forget who it was, and uh, she talked like a professor. She says, awfully good. He says, well, if you're going to be a lawyer, you'll make a good one. You better get out. <laughs> so, does anybody remember June Wanamaker? You know, she went to school with these people, too. Bernie and Letty and Mary Ann sister. Yeah. Uh, and June is the Paul one. and Reg. Yeah, yeah. yeah, 12, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, June now is the one that takes me to Maricrest every week. I go over there and play the piano for them. And uh, I'm 88 and I go back as far as they do, so I know the pieces they like. <laughs> so she takes me every time, and I think that's quite nice to think an old pupil would offer to do that for me. And I enjoy my six years of the uh, Ella Crow, do you remember her? She came after me. Did you have her, Ella Crow? No, I remember the name. No, I didn't have her, no. No. And uh, Margaret Sabatino often told me, like, I used to play a lot through the day, eh? Just not at the beginning, but when anything came up with, say, a slow piece or something. But I was trying to get them to love music, and they did love music. No. I'm going to move this just a little closer to oh, you. I'm, not to you that they're, that I'm afraid that they're missing some good stuff here. Oh, oh here. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, that's fine. Just pretend it isn't there. Oh, okay. Keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to know. Uh, you were telling us some memories. What about Letty Wanamaker and Ruth? Uh, uh, Jason, you were yeah. going to tell me a story about those. Well, people. that wasn't it when I had them. I think it was the year before. Because poor little um, Ruth, you know, had a black guy, a star guy. And uh, one day Ruth and Letty decided they'd go down at noon hour to get some candy. So when they came home, they got a knife somewhere and they went to cut the candy. And somehow the knife said that poor little Ruth was left blinded in one eye. She's now down in Florida. But I felt bad about that. It wasn't in my year, but she came to me the next year. I see. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, Eugene Sabatino, his mother <laughs> called me up one day and said, you know, Jimmy, uh, says, Eugene never sang around the house. He would never sing. We couldn't get him to sing. And after all the music you had, she said, he sings all the time now around the house. So I was pleased to hear that. So um, I'm proud of all my pupils that have won special awards too, like Neil here with the Sports Hall of Fame. And, and uh, oh, I found so much literature. I've saved all the stuff that was written about you. Oh, I brought you. it down. <laughs> The one story. <laughs> no one. Uh, there's about ten of them, and I 
and they oh, brought them here for, oh. to leave them because if you want them, you take them, and if not, they can have them. Uh, whoever wants them. And uh, Doug Hanlon has got an award for uh, the fireman, and Don Montgomery, I remember. And um, Jordan Coyle took the state award for his dad, Frank, who was a great man too. And Neil Watson for the hockey and all that was his award. So that's all that's on there. But I had a couple of things on here. I'm a kind of a squirrel to save stuff, and I saved these things all through the years and never think I'd ever use them again. I came here to teach here from Codrington, a little school on the side of the road, a little round red brick building. Every time you go to, from Camelford to Brighton, you go past it. And my mother used to teach there. I taught in the same school my mother taught in. But anyway, when I, in the last year that I was there, I remember we had a big concert, and there was this one little fella, Huey Ingram. <laughs> he was curly headed and black, and curly hair little guy, and uh, he was to learn a piece called Papa's Little Darling. And no matter what I would do, he'd get up and say, I'm Popeye's Little Darling. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how, what I learned before I came to Lakeville. <laughs> do you remember when I used to put the verse on the blackboard, uh, the leaves are fading and falling, the brooks are dry and dumb. But let me tell you, my darlings, the spring will be sure to come. <laughs> I always had that on the board, any place I got. One day we were making Mother's Day cards, I remember, and I said to the kids, it was here, I said, now don't forget your father. We were making a Mother's Birthday card, I said, and don't forget your father's birthday. And Joan Northey piped up, she says, I never forget my father's birthday, because it's the same day as Bingo's. <laughs> Bingo was her dog. <laughs> I remember that. Jean Coyle, remember, no, I wrote this years ago, years ago, just to, Jean Coyle remembers best how I once asked for the recipe of some cookies she brought to school and what a fuss I made over them. She went so proudly home to her mother and said, Miss Young, love my cookies. She even wants the recipe for them. Jean was so excited about that. In teaching over, oh, I told you that. Uh, I remember when I had to give Jimmy the scrap, <laughs> I went home and I cried. I felt so badly. I thought I must have failed to think I had to do that. <laughs> Despite my efforts to discipline. And his father, you know, it was good advice. Everett said to me, you know, you give the child the opportunity to choose or reject. Obedience is important, but you give them the chance to. Well, I remember when I gave Bible advice to the kids, when my grandchildren would come home, and I had six grandchildren, and I'd go put the dish of porridge up there like I did for all the other kids who were raisins in it. Oh, mother, you have to give them choices. You have to give them choices. So Charlie would say, the choice in this house is take it or leave it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I found out that Jimmy had a brilliant mind and he was just too restless. He was wanting to get on with things, you know, eh, Jimmy? And he plays a beautiful violin. Now he's always wanting to come down and play a duet. And he'll play. He'll play. But Miss Young, 
He turned out so well after one lick, and what if you don't lick him every day? Oh. <laughs> 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 I never thought of that. <laughs> and no trouble, whatever. The point was, I didn't have one bit of trouble with either Jimmy or Gordy Blake after that. They were just as good as they could be there. Nobody can tell me that as a last resort, it, it worked, you know, because we tried everything else. Would you agree with that, Keevan? I absolutely do. <laughs> good. <laughs> yes. Keevan has taught a good many years, too. How about you, John? Did you ever have to administer the, the strap? Yes, John. Oh, yeah, occasionally, but yeah, 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 I think it's uh -huh. as a last resort. I remember the, do you remember the red letter primer while I was first very really young? Excuse me, I'm just trying to see if I can say anything. You taught in Lakefield during the Second World War. Do you remember any particular sacrifices at that time that uh, children or you had to make? Or were there any, uh, well, there you any children who lost well, everything their Everything was rationed then, you know. Rationed? Oh, oh yeah. you only got so many and what teaspoons of sugar. <laughs> And gas and butter, <laughs> meat, everything was rationed. Oh, yes, that was the biggest thing I had to do. Yeah. Blue, ones Blue fiber with the hole in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, While Miss Young is looking through her notes, if you, you can think of some questions you would like to ask of her and uh, not to interrupt when she finishes, we'll uh, have a, a questioning period. Oh my goodness. Well, remember, you used to play with us in school. Oh, yes. Well, we're turning the tables on it. Well, don't ask me anything with numbers in it, because I'm no good on numbers. I'm better on words. Let the numbers be part of me. Sure. Okay. Well, anyway, oh, I was going to tell you about, do you remember how we used to cure them of chewing gum? If some kid was chewing gum, I didn't have to score or anything. I'd just say, come up to the front, Johnny, and put the gum. Put the gum, he had to put the gum on the end of his nose and stand there and everybody would laugh and so sick. And they sort of punished him himself, themselves without me having to say a word. And he just had to stand there with the gum on the end of his nose. <laughs> so I think that the main memory that I had. Well, I really appreciate the effort that uh, Ms. Young has gone together and has put, made these notes that she could share with us. And uh, uh, we would welcome any questions from uh, anyone on the floor. Uh, there's a teacher over there, uh, Ms. McCracken, uh, Sandra, oh, Sandy, but she wouldn't, uh, in her day, there'd be no strap. You wouldn't oh, no. There'd be any strapping. No. The only strap I remember is when I got it from Mr. Sloan. Oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't understand. But when you taught, they were in the spot on the child. There was no uh, strapping. And then he would start telling me that there must be other ways, Mrs. Young. Yeah, I can't understand that, Mrs. Young. I got it from him three times. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he got that from you. Maybe he got the idea from you. Do <laughs> you remember the first Xerox machines? Pardon? You remember the Xerox machines? Oh, yes. Those you stick the paper on the floor. Yeah, the purple. Do you remember the jelly? The jelly. The jelly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the jelly. Yeah. 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 Remember the little boats? Then we went Swing back to the Gestapo. Oh, yes. The swings and the key. Bicycle racks. racks. Oh, my. Yeah. See, you remember a lot yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Has anybody else got any special memories of what you did? I have a special memory, but I have a picture of uh, Miss Young in the, uh, the rubbish last here. Oh, for goodness sake. Just passing around, let people look at it. What year was that? I brought a picture. Well, I save everything out of the paper that they've been used, my Pittsburgh. And this is uh, uh, Doug Hamlin and Don Montgomery when they got a, their award. Oh, yes, Doug Hamlin and uh, Roy Watson and uh, Don Montgomery. Right. What was that for? 
uh, fire department. Uh, <coughs> this picture, I think, is precious because it explains why Jimmy was the way he was. <laughs> there is a picture of the whole school, and they were told to, uh, I think it was the year before I got there, there were the boys in the front all had to have their legs crossed. So they all sat with their legs crossed like that to look just the same. But Jimmy at the end, he didn't want any part of that protocol. And he sat there and hugged his knees like this. It looks different. And it just showed that he was a different child. He wanted to do things his own way. Do you remember that? Picture? I'm sure you do. I think that's so cute to see every one of them all sitting with their legs crossed. And Jimmy sitting there like this, his hand on his knees, because he was a different child. And he, he was trying to get out of there, I guess. I mean, you've mentioned a lot of men, uh, boys in your class. Oh, that are, don't you remember any women? Any oh, girls? Yes. <laughs> oh, I remember Helen Kelly, yes. Oh. <laughs> I don't know that. And uh, a lot of nice girls in there. But see, the girls didn't get in any trouble. It was the boys. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm not talking about that. You said you had no favorites. The, no, that's right. The girls were wonderful, too. And now there's Anne down there. Is it Margaret? No, it's Margaret. Margaret. Oh, How are you, Margaret? Hi. Thank you. Good. And Cora. Yeah. Isn't that great to see so many people in here? Oh, I saved this because it's a I'm going to leave all this with you if you want to put it. That's the day they had the reception for Miss Oh, Davis yeah, here's Davis. a reception for Miss Davis and Miss Kidd. Uh huh. If you want any of these, you can have them now. If you'd like to keep them for the historical society. In the archives, we know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, that's nice. Yeah. I think. Uh, in your era, when you taught, did you have to ask permission of the board to become married? Oh, no. No. Okay. Apparently that was... I amazing. went to school with Charlie. No, we went to school together. There's a picture in 1940. Are there any other questions? Anyone have any subjects they'd like to ask or inquire of Miss Young? I see another one of your pupils at the rear there, Bill Twist. Oh, I didn't you see must have to right there. Give him the strap. Oh, yeah. No, I never did have to give him the strap. He was a good pupil. And he's won lots of awards, too. I didn't even I've got your clippings, too, something. Yeah. yeah. This, this is at least on the same topic, but I was going through some of Bob's notes on education. They're written in code, of course, but I deciphered a little bit, but they talked about. Two examples. One was you want to have the mic? No, that's okay. One was public school leaving, and the other one was entrance examination. Now, yeah. Well, what would that sort of compare to now? <laughs> the entrance exam. Uh, Doug's asking about it. And what was the other one? Public school leaving. Oh. Did you graduate from public school? I'm not familiar with the public school leaving, but yeah, I'm sure you could explain what the entrance exam was. Uh, well, they studied all year, the ones in grade eight, you see, they yes. said, well, we call it senior fourth then, to pass the entrance. That allowed you to enter into high school, if you got that yes. certificate. Anyway, they talked about standards being raised now. Well, this goes back to 1890. And uh, they raised standards then, too, because in 1890, you had to have a 367 aggregate marks to pass. In 1897, it had gone up to 429. And by golly, by 1899, it was 550. And uh, in those books, there's <laughs> a lot of marks. The information which would be classified now, you couldn't get it out. But you know, teachers but some of your ancestors are probably in there, and if you want to see how they did, you can have a look. But Miss Eileen uh, Eileen was a compassionate teacher, I'm sure, and I, all the teachers I knew, and I was myself. At the end of the year, you'd have a borderline case, so 
If it was 49, you'd probably make it a 50. And if they were close to honors and needed one mark, you could probably dig it up somewhere. And I think this went on back in those days, too, because there was one year with only 11 boys, but two of them had marks of 550, which was just what we recorded. But then you got to wonder what poor old Wellington Crawford did. He must have committed some horrible sins because he ended up with a mark of 549. One short time. So <laughs> I guess they had a way of getting you without strapping in those days. <laughs> But, you know, the, when you were saying that, it, it came across my mind that if I were a teacher and I had 46 pupils and I didn't want 56 next year, I'd certainly be able to look after those advocate marks. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't work in the school I was in because you had from grade one to grade eight in the one room, I, 38 of them one teacher. Right. So if you fail, if you just bump it up behind you. I think there was a lot to be said for a one room school. Yeah. There was. Because you learn from the younger, you learn from the senior classes when they were operating or doing anything. You learn from them. I think it had a lot to be said. You did, Aileen, because I was, I think it was grade four before I ever had a grade. Yeah. You might do reading with grade three. If math wasn't very good, you could be in grade two. Or, but if that was your favorite, you might be yeah. doing grade five now. Could I ask all of those present who taught in any type of school other than a reform school at one time or another to stand, please? So we see how many teachers we have. <laughs>
on the reader. And one other thing. She's the one who got us an editor in the person of Alec Edmondson. We were at a point one time when we didn't just know how to school book. We had nobody in our own community who could just take that in hand. And she's the one that proposed Alec Edmondson when she was under to know him and knew him. And it was one of the greatest things that ever happened. So I also wanted to ask you one thing, I mean, you mentioned that you like teaching uh, English, and I've observed or read what you've written in your own book and your letters to the newspaper. And would you ever think that your skill with English might have rubbed off on a lot of your pupils? I think it I hope good. so. <laughs> well, I hope so. I think I didn't have that much skill that I thought they did. Uh, well, you'll have to read my book about the it's called Blue Mountain Blues. Blue Mountain Blues? That's the name of my book. The last one. This will be my last book. I put my order in with Edna tomorrow. <laughs> we'll be looking forward to that. Blue Mountain Blues by Miss Eileen Young. Or is this going to be Nathaway Nan? Oh, no, Eileen Young. It's going to be your own name. Uh, that concludes our Just interview minute, for this evening. Oh, no, Neil? excuse me. We have another picture. Uh, Neil, um, I feel it only fitting, Miss Young. Uh, would you give us your favorite tune on the piano before you left? Oh my goodness, I have so many. Favorites. Well, whatever you. Well, I'll do it if you'll sing. Okay. 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 Uh, Jim, you Kevin, you don't have the fiddle with you, do you? Miss Young, do you remember using teacher, Mr. Randrod or Randrod? Randrod. Both of them. Young piano, too, isn't it? I don't know what we're showing. No, is it the one behind? No, that one there. I understand that was Grace Young. I don't know.
down by the riverside. Down by the riverside. Son, wipe your feet, everyone, wipe your feet. And that saved a lot of work for him, you know. <laughs> that one summer, I had the pressure of working with Ralph Lawson at the school when I was about, I don't know, 16 or something. And uh, Tommy Hammond from Morrison was a bricklayer. And Tommy and I are up, uh, there were huge big chimneys on that school. And we had to rebuild the chimney. And I was kind of more than that and carried the bricks. And I went away up there working the hot, hot, they oh, it must have been 95. And uh, Joe Blue's wife come out, Jean, out to the back into her garden like that. So I got behind and I gave her a great, great big whistle at her, you know. Tommy says, you're going to get us in trouble, young man. I said, oh, she won't mind that. 
Well, she might. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't long we were working away there, and we heard a whistle. And I said, what's that? And Tommy said, well, somebody's down there at the bottom of the ladder. So we went down to look, and there was Jean with a great big tray of lemonade for us. <laughs> I said, that's not much trouble, Tommy. <laughs> Tommy still lived out in Warsaw, I believe. He's 95 or 6 now. He's quite an age. But the caretakers, between uh, Ralph Watson and Tommy Hampton, you had a history book of yourself, but I'm not kidding. Mm -hmm. Stories about war said it went on and on and on. I had the most entertaining summer I spent in years and years. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone else that would like to share a story, or did you bring something? Um, I have some of the uh, early books uh, here that I'll leave out for uh, people to look at. And uh, Ms. Young was asking about this bell. Well, when I retired from teaching, uh, anyone who retired within the last five years, this is what they did. They gave us a bell like this uh, each day. So uh, it's pretty special for that. So, so please uh, uh, get some coffee and enjoy yourself. And, uh, uh, and that book on Dural that you were mentioning, Ms. Kibeki, I have that one here. Um, and there is a section on uh, the schools. It's called the Township Schools. And